It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here for our Wednesday afternoon new faculty lecture series presentation. Today we'll be privileged to participate in a reading by our distinguished creative writing artist in residence in the Department of English, Dr. Wendy Barnes. Dr. Barnes, who was raised in Prairieville, Louisiana, has lived in New York and New Jersey for many years. Her poetry has appeared in publications including Narrative, Story South, Painted Bride Quarterly, No Deer, Spoon River Review, Slice Magazine, and Cold Front. Dr. Barnes's art and poetry, poetry reviews appear in Frog Magazine and the Adroit Journal. Her forthcoming book, Landscape with Blood Feud, was a finalist for the Crab Orchard Series in Poetry First Book Award and was the recipient of the Juniper Prize for Poetry from the University of Massachusetts Press. So having said all of that, um, I will let Dr. Barnes and her work speak for herself and itself. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Barnes to the new faculty lecture series. Thank you so much, everybody. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Dr. Macy, for that fine introduction. I'm so grateful that you could all be here in the middle of the afternoon to share some poetry and prose with me. It's a real privilege to have this kind of reading. And I appreciate the efforts of everyone who's helped to set this up, especially Dr. Macy and Dr. Vaughn. This reading is running at about 36 minutes, so we should have a little bit of time for questions, though I'm happy to answer questions from anyone at any time. I meant to post my email address up in the chat, though I'm sure it's fairly easy to find. Please contact me at any time with any questions regarding this presentation or anything else you'd like to discuss related to creative writing. So I have a book of poems coming out, Dr. Macy referred to entitled Landscape with Blood Feud. This book is about my home state of Louisiana and it's a volume of poems that are set in colonial times through the present. So kind of a complete historic panoply of the state. And it's told from the perspective of a speaker who is working on figuring out a fraught relationship that she has with her home state and her white working class roots. Yesterday was Mardi Gras and I'm going to read a poem that is not exactly a Mardi Gras poem, though it does have what I will call Mardi Gras elements. The title of this poem is The Revenant Retraces Her Steps. When I got the chigger under chigger itch, when I forded the river, found the same cows on the other side, it was time. When my people of heavy stock turned their hammers to the sky, hacked out great blue chunks, and then the ghosts of those old conquerors oozed back up through my veins, it was time when I'd wagered away my fortune in earthworms, when the radio played only staticky news and confusion ran so deep I had to look up for the lowdown. It was time when I almost caught the beat but lost it down a sinkhole, when my brass band marchers fell out under the sun and rogue parades danced down my alley all day, every day. When the fish kill and schooled up trout smells lost their magic, it was time when I could no longer taste a coming storm's ozone on the wind, and I could hold only two cupfuls of brown water at once. Night damp went terminal, crawfish keeled over, unhinging their pincers, then friends forgot my name. 
Qualms, catfish barb stuck in my throat. The last mosquito of my hope was diagnosed. I held out my palm and caught a single drop of rain. And it was then I looked down the open road. This next poem is takes place in my home parish. So for anyone who doesn't know, parishes are like counties in Louisiana. And my home parish is called Ascension Parish. But this poem is called Affliction Parish. The plant puffs a final cloud through nuclear smokestacks. Under the numb of sunrise, our synapses atrophied in sweet tea. We watch the floodwaters surge, then retreat and spit out our double wides, sprawled belly up and helpless. The rivers know better. It branches out, spins its slow arms loose, and tempts the gulf to come on in and swamp the turbines. Hey there, gale force and heavy drizzle. Between dinner and supper, we watch cotton balls rot in their bowls. The pressure drops. Some baby squalls wash away everybody's duck blinds and righteous rage. We toss our empties in parking lot weeds, find the drunken union rep heel drug and drowned in his optimism. Past the courthouse, the sad single oil well churns its mud butter. Welcome, recovery task force, and whoops. Looks like you mistook our unemployment line for a load-bearing wall, but why not? You need to rest the new foundation on somebody's bones, plus our sorry nuclei are always wrong. The church shuts up early on payday, but we go in for bootleg faith and any remedy that peels us for a minute from our wet skins and thunder counting. Hello, trespass and B and E. Pecans batter the squad car. Little fists of grief the trees shake down. The prison gate clangs against its hinges. Somebody's muffler chugs, told you so, told you so, telling us so. I think the worst day ever to be congested. I don't know, I feel like I have uh, allergies already, but it's not quite spring yet. Can you hear me okay though? This next poem also takes place in my hometown where there runs a bayou called Bayou Manchac. And it's a kind of revision of the folkloric character of the mermaid. It's a bit suggestive. There are some double entendres, just trigger warning about that, I guess. Bayou Manchac Love Report. How many overboard Lotharios does it take to wrangle a girl, hogtie her to a fish story? Five knots past the water spout and way more treacherous. Randy Boatman dredge pork girl lips to wrap around their briny daydreams. Men moon about in their pierrots, gorged on rumors of sirens as in bevies, as in plural, who wiggle fishtails, flash creamy underbellies through bayou gloom. How does desire lay its claim through thick water? Men imagine barely legal spreads of scuffed up innocence in forms made more perfect by longing. Husbands return on the regular, exhaust the shore with their hunger. 
Flashlights spark a pilgrim galaxy in mist. One wades through his spell, hip boot deep, dangling alligator bait, calling, pretty please, mermaid, wiggle my way. What if it's a girl bred on benzene punch, elixir of vinyl chloride poured free from the trailer faucet, who now trolls that bayou, tough as possum teeth? Sometimes a sweet gum tree gets bitter, cries its prickly seeds, and so does a girl who's been hunted so long she almost forgets she is human. What if one day she answers the fisherman's whimper? Okay, I'll show you what I am. She breaks the surface, arcs a slender neck, an arm that ends in flippered fingers. They grab for the rim of his boot. This next poem is about a horrific incident that occurred in New Orleans just post Katrina that many of us may remember. Uh, called the Danziger Bridge shooting. And uh, what happened was six innocent civilians unarmed were crossing the Danziger Bridge, which connects Gentilly, a suburb of New Orleans, to Orleans East. And police opened fire on them and shot all six and killed two of them. And then there was this horrific cover up. Eventually, five of the police officers involved went to prison. But this is a speaker who's returning to that bridge after many years. Danziger Bridge Redux. The center of the movable bridge ascends with a groan. The yawn of some bored sea god now coasting past my windshield. The tanker's prow, curved like proud shoulders, grazes the fog. Plush white billows backfill its empty wake. There are two sides to a bridge, but the other side flashes and fades like an illusion. Are there two sides? Perspective spins within the wall of cloud. On one side, Bayou Sauvage, a wagon procession snakes riverward. Wheels and feet creep, buteau like through mud, as if a sub-sea level pit of slack has held the settlers all this time. Bound by the swamp's maternal reek, their progress suspended in cricket voices. On one side, the river still lies coiled, vengeance sitting hard in its gut. The gulf still churns its glass innocence. On another, the angel of history watches the wreckage rise. Boats pile atop the shore, cars pooling in the elbows of off ramps, whole houses, ancient oaks uprooted. He tries to close his wings. The helicopter blades beat him back, beat him back. On one side, an 18th century manifest, torn and tossed into the sea, slips through the memory nets. I have to admit the failing of my one-time faith in structures, child of America, that I believed they were built to hold everybody the same. On one side, thirst, a pocket full of change, a shopping cart wobbles up the on-ramp, and on the other, a gentilly bound cruiser coasts silent, lights whipping the currents of afternoon breeze. Then the gunshots. And then there are no more sides. A hole blows through the fog, and the center of the bridge of memory collapses, each of us idling on their opposite shore, 
staring into one another's headlights over the waters, their slow ache through the industrial canal. The bridge plate descends again, clanks into place, but answers nothing. I put the car in gear, head for Orleans East. In the rear view, I catch glimpses of the girders and abutments, but the reflection drifts like spirits and old windows. I am driving over air, barely skimming the metal grate, like the bridge was never there. So Louisiana is a very complicated place, which can be said of just about any place. And by complicated in this sense, I mean it has a history of racism and misogyny and uh, dispossession of indigenous lands and destruction of indigenous communities and industrial exploitation of lands and pollution of land and water and air and all of these things can be said of a lot of places like probably also Oklahoma, for example. But Louisiana also has the shameful distinction of having been the center really of the American trade in enslaved people. And all of these things together, you know, conspire to make this the central question of my writing life for the past several years as I've been writing this book and really since I've been writing it all, which is how do I portray these conditions and events and atrocities without uh, appropriating anyone else's culture or experiences or memories? And how can I do it ethically and responsibly? As a white writer, I'm not really sure that that's possible. And the jury is very much out on this entire question. And uh, Dr. Vaughn put for me up in the chat, there are a couple of books that I can recommend for anyone who'd like to read more about the questions surrounding appropriation. It's a very current question, especially in the poetry community. So uh, the two books listed there, Appropriate by Paisley Rectal and then um, the other title with uh, Claudia Rankin. They're great. What the, the Claudia Rankin is a series of essays and then Appropriate is a book that Paisley Rectal wrote addressed to one of her students. And they're both fantastic to get some perspective on these issues. In my own work, I have chosen to ask questions about you know, my own aesthetic and artistic responsibility as well as my personal responsibility. And the last poem that I'll read is pretty long. It's told from the perspective of a speaker who's trying to reject these questions altogether. The part-time penitence guide to modern farming. I am not back then. I am not a fallen monument, whole bitten flag, bayou village afire, but I was born on a farmland acre, dogleg off the two lane to highway 44, a farmland acre, it's grass just like the grass across the road. I am not back then, when we took horse teams and backhoes, flattened burial mounds, took rakes and dragged our disregard across the earth. We ravaged any pasture like locusts, stripping every thistle, eating every stiff or wiggling grub that we dug up and said, it's just some soulless thing I found in a woods, not even something's parent, and I'm hungry and can't help it. I can ignore what is not me, I am not the past, but I was born a mile from it, where blackberry thorns run along the fence behind the honky-tonk to the courthouse, memory of pistol smoke and hoofbeats, shouts of the disappeared. 
I may not be the past, but I was born right on top of it. I grew right in it, hoed out furrows, stuck my fingers in the soil, made cradles for the baby kernels that would sprout new corn. It came up white, silver queen, ambrosia, country gentleman. Doesn't everybody have to make a living? Doesn't everybody have to leave their own heart in aspic sometimes? Close up the jar, heart jelly. Ditto your old folks and all their unspeakable deeds. Please, I'm trying to ignore what is not me. So can we also jelly our every guilty gene and stick them in the fridge where they will keep my old folks had a slop jar like that way back. They stowed it in a cargo hold clear across the Atlantic, dumped it in some fields they found here that looked empty, said these are just one or two lonely fields. They would be better planted with chunks of our hubris. And then they grew. Ugly brown buds clumped up high on the stalk unfurled their spiky wings, spilled fluffy white guts over field upon field of pitiless rose, upland cultivars, white varieties, coker, delta pine, history bleeds us all for its tax, some for more, digging down into every wet wound, digging down among the tap roots, under old folks' marble tombs or unmarked graves, mass graves. There is no ceremony under cotton fields, just old folks wronged. And I am standing on that soil, trying not to hear them. I feel bad about it all, but I'm just trying to listen to my headphones. I'm just trying to weed these pole beans. I'm just on my lunch break. I am just trying to get by. And besides, who can afford to pay a debt that's figured in lifetimes? Some nights I hear voices beneath the oil refinery's hum. And Sundays, when it's quiet, I hear them hymns of all the faded parishioners. What they want is to come home, come home, to have their faces recognized. Tonight, their chorus drowns out the cicadas. It swells and swells until it almost eats me. Okay, I say, well, then I am the past. But I'm still standing idle, empty-handed, neck deep in well-wishing. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes, for an outstanding reading. Wonderful, wonderful work. It's a delight. I imagine there may be some questions, comments, and reflections that people here would like to share. So I'd just like to open up the floor to anyone who might like to speak. I would like to comment. Can I comment? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, hi, Dr. Barnes. Um, I would like to comment and say that I think your poems were very nice and you uh, captured the essence of Louisiana very well in all the pieces that you had. I've only been to Louisiana maybe like once and that was like when I was like 10. So you captured it very well. So I want to applaud you on that because your imagery and your scenery is really good and the poems like kind of put you back in the feel of your hometown and just the area that you were from. So I think you did a really good job on that. I liked all your poems. Thank you very much. Yeah, certainly you want to evoke the area, right? And one of the things that was a challenge, I think, with this book was trying to evoke the area without relying on cliches, you know, like lots of gumbo and mama and them and stuff like that. So thank you. Other comments, reflections, questions for Dr. Barnes? I really love your use of imagery uh, in both works, your poetry and your prose, but I particularly was attached to the, uh, the poetic images. 
Um, they actually, to an extent, remind me of the art of Nicoletta Ciccoli, if you've ever seen her. Like, there's there's something about, like, when I imagine what you're describing, it feels that way. It feels the same way that when I look at her paintings, I imagine. Um, but I wanted to ask, like, what inspires these types of images for you? Like, do, do they come from the memory that sparks the poetry, or are they carefully crafted for the feeling? Oh, that's a really good question. I think, you know, certainly all of the images have to come from memory on some level, but, you know, as I was just talking about, certainly wanting to avoid cliche and, and um, a lot of times the images are in some ways defamiliarized from reality, right? And part of that was that I wanted the book to have a kind of um, extra, not kind of an extra reality, right? Not a super reality, but I didn't want it to read as, as strict realism. And finding that balance is really hard too, because obviously I'm talking about some very sensitive subjects and not in everyone, but so, uh, you know, finding a balance where I, I had enough reality to ground the poems, but enough kind of defamiliarization to have the aesthetic effect that I wanted was, was tricky. Does that answer it, Foster? Yeah, and I think that goes with the uh, the comparison I made because I feel like Chicoli's work is very similar and like it's, Loki, hold on, my cat is being annoying. Um, it is real and unreal at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know that artist's work, but I'm so glad that you've brought that up because it's always useful. I, I love, you know, taking a look at art from any other genre or metier to, to see how it might reflect on my own. And I, I find when, when people have that kind of gut reaction, it's very, it's usually very useful for me. So thank you for that. Dr. Putnam. Um, I, I really appreciated this, Dr. Barnes. Um, I really was thinking about that last poem that you offered um, that that the idea of this person who, you know, was struggling with this idea of I'm not the past and sort of don't blame me and I may not be the past. I liked how you used your repetition there, and you were saying I may not be the past, but I grew right on top of it. I'm 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 paraphrasing some of this because I was trying to write uh, as you were speaking, and I just really liked how you were um, how you could tell this person had this immense struggle and then was getting to then, okay, then I am the past this, this recognition that we are in, in some ways responsible or ethically um, related to uh, these issues of the past. So I thought it was really powerful. And the one thing that I, that I realized as I was writing, when you were offering um I think they were sort of the excuses from the narrator when uh, the person is saying, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, I was like, oh, and it's like, I feel some kind of justice or something, or I am just um, there too, that there was that double entendre that I just really liked. And I thought um, I would just say that, woo, I liked it. <laughs> so I, I just, uh, I thought the poem was really powerful um, with that. So I don't really have a question for it. It was just a comment. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, in your description, you were saying that the poem is addressing, addressing whatever responsibility we have or relationship to the past, right? And so it's hard to even describe what it is because I think it's very complicated and it's certainly something that is different for everyone in terms of their thinking about it, right? But but I thought that that was a good way to, to discuss it, to start discussing it because I think you can't discuss it in just one straight line. There have to be a number of different ways of, of even approaching that discussion. And the the struggle part was, 
was a good tension for the poem. I mean, you 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 always need tension in the poem, but it, in that sense, that was very useful in the construction of the poem. But of course, I knew it was going to have that from the beginning because that was the point of the poem was showing someone um, who I found fairly distasteful, you know, telling the poem from a, the position of someone with whom I don't agree, which is, is hard to do. But showing them have that struggle was really the point of the poem. Thank you. Okay, do we have other questions and comments, Dr. Silcox? Hi, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that too. I, I was very affected by the Danziger Bridge shooting uh, poem and I really like the sort of the decision to, to to take a retrospective tone on the whole thing. This is the, the standard boring question about sources. Was there someone you spoke to about that uh, or, or something you read about that that you found especially helpful? Because I've found it a struggle to find interesting or well-written sources of that, of that incident, which was, was pretty sort of You're singular. Right. You're right. And there's actually very little that's still online as a kind of a comprehensive source, you know, I mean, aside from Wikipedia or something, um, even in the like, um, the Times Picayune was the New Orleans paper that is no more, but the NOLA, it's now the NOLA archives. And there are articles, but you have to read many, right? There's there, you know, you have like uh, encyclopedia sources that are good sources for that. But no, it was really a, um, knowledge from watching lots of videos over the years. There's a lot of stuff that came on YouTube. There's a lot of, there was a 60 minutes, a couple of 60 minutes pieces about it. And then um, articles that I had from over the years, trying to find as much detail as I could to make it um, realistic and also authentic to the experience. And then obviously, you know, going back into history and drawing in all, all sorts of other sources and um, experiences to the time. But yeah, and that's an important question for poets, right? Is, you know, poetry doesn't have to be true, right? But if you're dealing with an incident of this much import, I think you have to be pretty clear about your obligations to report the essential parts um, as truthfully as possible, right? That, that these, these folks were shot going up an on-ramp, a one with a shopping cart, you know, these things I didn't make up. And, and to me, that's important. I think that, that we have an obligation to make those kinds of details accurate, even if the rest is, you know, loose. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wendy, I wanted to um, sort of pick up on what what Foster was saying. You know, um, they were reminded of of an artist, and I I remember as you were reading your poetry, how much when you know reading your poetry when you applied. I I remember that the word palimpsest was in my mind. You know, because I love the way you use. Um, that you have a sense of the land as a palimpsest, you know, that, that, it, that it, you, you can't really write about a place unless you understand its layers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's in your work. I mean, you, the word history came up in at least two of your poems. Um, and so I really, I really love that about it. And I don't know, maybe pentimento is actually the better word because the thing that I was thinking about when I was um, listening today was, do, do you know The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Merlan Kundera? There's a character in there who all of her work, um, it has it has a, a, a places where it, it looks like the paper's been torn and there's a picture under it. And she's sort of deliberately layering this palimpsest in it. And I, I thought of that. So um, I, I just wondered, it, it, do you think you do that? Do you think place is a, um, I mean, is that, is that a spark, you know, is that where it starts for you sometimes? You mean the place is the first thing that you, well, certainly for this book it was because, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people write about their home for the, their first book and a lot of Southern poets do this, you know, that, 
there's this poet I studied with Brian Tier, and he's really fantastic. He's based out of Philadelphia now and he's from Alabama. And he's like, yeah, my first book was a Southern book too, you know, but um, I, I like your analogy of the palimpsest because I knew that I had to create some kind of layering to, uh, to do justice to Louisiana in particular, right? Because because of the complexities, I mean, when you think about New Orleans, it's like, I think you think about it in those terms, it's either collage or palimpsest or because of the diversity, because of all the things that are going on all the time, because of the history, the, the layers, the, the class, the, the racial strife, all of the things. So yeah, there was a deliberate attempt to layer it in that way. So if that's coming out, I'm really glad. And I do think that place is very strong in my poems in general. And I'm writing a new book of poems, which is about something completely different. And I am having trouble, try, I'm trying not to make place the start. Because if you're writing a lyric poem, you don't always want it to be attached to a place, right? Sometimes you want it to be sort of out in the ether in a way that you don't want prose to be usually. And so I'm trying to start from language and, and incident uh, much more so than place. But that's a really good question. Can I ask a follow-up? May I? I I'll, I'll stop. Fiction. I was really excited to read it because I've been, I know that you've been working on it. And I noticed that it's a braid, you know, um, that, that you've got, you've got, um, the, the section more or less written as a letter in, in the Netherlands, in the hospital, and then you've got the other section, you know? And so since a braid has three pieces and since the, the classic creative nonfiction braid has three pieces, I'm just wondering, is there gonna be a third piece and, and where will that one be if you do? Well, at this stage, I'm not even sure those sections are gonna stay the way they are. I like them for now, but I've started a whole new thing. So it's kind of formally in flux. Um, and I honestly didn't want to read the new sections because they're so new, you know, I mean, this one, these are pretty new, but they're brand new. And I thought I can't do that. That's crazy talk. So um, I, I do, you know, what, what I'm working with as of that draft is my personal history as an artist, his personal history as an artist and the illness, which I guess you could see as three separate braids. But I'm also working with another strand, which is kind of about um, contemporary life for artists, and where artists fit into the social structure told through stories, you know, of, of his life, my life and his friends' lives. So I guess you maybe have four in that case. Yeah. Well, one one part of the braid has to be glittery. So that that sounds like that's that's the part that that sparkles like that. That's really cool. Thank you. I, I'm excited for you. Thank you. Dr. Kang, did you want to? Yes, and I'll be quick. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for your reading. So uh, so when when you were reading your poems and, and then later when you were reading pieces from your memoir, for some reason I was thinking about um, Worsworth, right? Mm -hmm. Preface to Lyrical Ballads, you know, and I, it took me a long time to, to find that sentence, right? There neither is nor can be any essential difference between the language of prose mm -hmm. and metrical com composition. Mm -hmm. And it's weird for him to say that, but for someone like me who doesn't, I don't really consume a lot of creative writing myself. Mm -hmm. And when I was listening to your poetry, I was really holding on to the storytelling element. Just, mm -hmm. just for me, that's my, my entry point. But when you were reading your memoir, I noticed how poetic it was. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, this is a very basic question. So you work, you write in two modes, right? Poetry and memoir. and mm -hmm. As a creative writer, do you really think about genre? And, and how much do you think about genre when you are, when you're writing? Mm -hmm. When I got my MFA, it was 
Mm-hmm. It was all about hybrid text and hybrid forms, but I was, I was mostly hybridizing like poetry, poetics and critical theory. Um, there are a lot of really great fiction writers and memoirists who are writing in kind of hybrid forms nowadays. Uh, Jenny Awful is one of my favorites. And Claudia Rankin is another. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I have it in the back of my mind. I mean, I compose through sound and, and that's true whether I'm writing prose or poetry. And I think that's the case for a lot of writers. I do think that I am in a different mindset when I'm writing prose than when I'm writing poetry. And I have a very hard time working seriously on both at the same time. Meaning if I'm in a poetry mode, I'm working on that that week. And if I'm in a prose mode, I'm working on that that week. And it's hard to switch back and forth. I think because of the compression of the language in poetry, while I composed by sound for each. I think that compression takes a different kind of thought than prose thinking does. And I'm, I'm, you know, other writers who write both prose and poetry might, might feel differently. They might be able to do both at the same time, but I have a very hard time with it. But I do think that, um, you know, part of this departure that I was just telling Dr. Squires about is that I've loosened this memoir up and it's become a little more poetic and it's starting to take a form of like short paragraphs that connect to each other kind of elliptically and associatively. Um, So in a way, Dr. Kang, that's a, a way that I'm moving out away from that form that I was thinking in with the memoir to begin with or that genre. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> There's only a little bit of it done like that so far. I don't know what's going to happen. Hey, Dr. Vaughn. I just wanted to point out that there are several comments in the chat from Corbin Porter. And um, if you haven't seen them, I can read them aloud if you'd like. Please. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, if, um, they say, I'm so glad you're talking about ethical responsibility and appropriation. This has been so hard on my mind lately. Mm. Corbin also says, uh, late to the discussion, but Patricia Smith's poem, Skinhead, mm-hmm. is also a really incredible poem where the speaker is a white supremacist and the poet is a black woman. Mm-hmm. It's brought to mind by the difficulty you spoke about through writing in the perspective of a person you disagree with. Mm-hmm. That's a really good example, Corbin. And that's what I'll have to remember for class because a lot of times students want to write through that kind of perspective and they need models. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you find the discussion of appropriation useful because I think it's on a lot of people's minds today and it should be if it's not. <laughs> so I'm thinking, you know, in the future in, in poetry workshops, I think one or either of those books is a good one to draw from uh, because this is a huge question for poetry today. And, and it's a question for prose writers as well, of course. Um, poetry is, uh, everybody's really getting down to the, to the nitty gritty and the discussion of it. And I'm actually writing an article on it right now. And I'm a little afraid to even wade into those waters, but the book's doing it. So I figure I should just go ahead, wait out, get out in front of it. But thank you for those comments, Corbin. Okay. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Barnes, for an outstanding reading. Um, thank you. Multiple readings and for this great discussion. Um, it was a pleasure to have you here. We're very excited to have you as part of our community, as our artist in residence. And thank you, everyone, for being here. The next new faculty lecture will take place on the Wednesday after spring break on March 23rd at 3.30 p.m. on Zoom. And we will be hearing from Dr. Megan Whitley, visiting assistant professor of English. So I look forward to seeing you then and between now and then as well. Take care and thank you again, Dr. Barnes. Thank you so much. It was really a pleasure.